This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Use the links in the description to visit their store. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's Saturday. That means it's time for Nitsa Notes, my weekly vlog series about limited magic. We're still early on in Foundations Limited season, but now we have enough data over on 17 lands to start to have some bigger takeaways, especially about specific cards in the format. So in this video, I'm going to be taking a look back at my set review and talk about 10 cards I was wrong about based on how the format has actually panned out. In this video, as I often do in this series, I'll be using 17 lands data to discuss cards. If you don't know what that is, you can go over to 17lands.com and they will track your Magic Arena data. They do it for lots and lots of players, so we end up with this massive sample size about how cards are performing, and that's what makes all this data possible. So let's dive in with a look at these 10 cards I got wrong. I wanna say up front that um, something strange happened in this set that doesn't usually happen, and that is that um, the mistakes I made were mostly because I overrated cards. <laughs> you know, if you've been watching my set reviews, I don't know how long I've been doing them now, a long time, seven-ish years. And um, usually when I'm wrong, it's because I underrate a card. I'm pessimistic. I don't know if I was unusually positive when I was doing the foundation set review or what was going on, but of the 10 cards we're looking at, nine of them are cards I overrated. This is always a useful exercise too, you know, not just to say, you know, look, I'm not perfect at card evaluation because nobody is, but it's also a good way to get a feel for what's different about this format based on how I expected these cards to pan out. And it always makes me better. It makes people who watch this better at card evaluation because you can see where you went wrong. All right, so let's dive in and start with a look at Tolarian Terror. So this one's interesting. It's one of two reprints that are on this list. And uh, yeah, last time we saw Talarian Terror, it was amazing. It was an incredibly powerful card for blue red decks in Dominaria United. It was one of the best commons in the set and a card you really needed for your blue red decks to go off. This format, not so much. So what's different here about Dominaria United? So when I did the set review, I gave it a build around grade. I said, you know, I think it'll be a C minus in most blue decks, which will have enough spells to make it cheaper, but not like amazing, but a B in a blue red spells deck, or maybe in a blue black deck too, I said, you know, which is supposed to be a graveyard deck. Why does this have such a horrible win rate of 51.8%? And by the way, if you sort it by color pairs to blue red, it's not any better. So it's not like it's performing super well in blue red or blue black either. It's just not very good across the board. So it's certainly not a C minus uh, in most blue decks and certainly not a B in the right deck for it. So there are a few things that are different. One thing is that Dominaria United had much more of a synergy thing going on. I mean, this set has archetypes, but as I said during the set review and in the archetype guide and in other videos, you know, synergy matters, but like these really broad archetypes where an entire color pair's deck is built completely around the thing, there's less of that in this set. There's less of that going on than we've seen in a long time, which is usually how core sets go. And so there's not this critical mass of super cheap spells to get Talarian Terror going, like there was in Dominaria United. There are spell payoffs around to be sure, but there aren't like a huge number of them that incentivize you to go down this road with Talarian Terror. In short, it's not that easy to get Talarian Terror to be really cheap in like the early to mid game, which is what you need to be doing with it most of the time, and it just doesn't happen in the format. So overall, there's, there's less synergy going on, so it's a lot harder to pull off, and that's really the biggest factor in Talarian Terror's downfall from being a really important common last time we saw it to being not very good. In fact, I'd say it's an F in most blue decks now and a D build around. Like, you'll play it if you end up with a super synergistic spell deck, but they aren't that easy to get going. Next, I want to look at a card that this is one where I just, I don't know what I was doing. It's one of these, there's one of these every time where I'm like, why did I give this the grade I did in retrospect? Like the other ones I can sort of deconstruct how I was thinking at the time. And this card that I'm talking about is Goblin Negotiation. So I gave this a B minus, if you can believe it. And to your credit, all of you viewers out there, there were many comments who were like, you're going to be wrong about that one. And I started to think even before, you know, the set came out, I was like, I'm probably wrong about that one. 
like I said, I don't know why I was so unusually optimistic during during Foundation's limited review, uh, but somehow I thought Goblin Negotiation being this super inefficient removal spell that had the upside of giving me some tokens would be fine, but it just isn't. It's too expensive. I mean, if you pay five mana to kill an X3, that's a horrible rate, and if you pay six to kill an X3 and get one Goblin, that's not great either. And it's very difficult for this to kill some of the bigger threats in the format, something you usually need to be able to do because it's so expensive and so clunky. And it's got a 52.2% win rate to back that up. By the way, should mention um, that these win rates look better than they actually are because 17 lands users average win rate is 54.5%. In other words, this is about 2.3% below that average win rate. And while, while that may not sound like a lot in terms, when you're talking about a zero-sum game like Magic, which obviously for 17 lands, it's not quite a zero-sum game or the win rate would be 50%, but it's close and a couple of percentage points is massive. And, you know, Goblin Negotiation just is not a good card. Nowhere close to a B-. minus, And I think it's an F overall. It's just very difficult for it to ever feel like you're getting a good deal. And most of the time, you look at this card in your hand and you go, I can't do anything with this. <laughs> and that's a pretty big problem. All right, let's look at the one card on here that I underrated, and that is Dazzling Angel, which I gave a C plus to. That's a pretty good grade for a common. Usually that means it's in the upper echelon of commons, especially in its color. Um, and, you know, a three mana two three flyer is still a pretty good rate these days, you know, as I've often been talking about lately, you know, getting above two toughness in most formats, but it's very true in this one because of Burst Lightning and Stab. You've got to have your three mana creatures. They have to be able to survive those spells when they're cast for one. And Dazzling Angel meets that, you know, litmus test. And then it has some pretty real upside. You know, a minute ago I was talking about how Synergy is not a huge deal in this format. And I do think that's mostly true, especially like color pairs being really into doing one specific thing. But the one color pair where that's the least true or where it's easiest to pull off payoffs is black-white because there are all these life gain payoffs. Most of them are pretty easy to trigger, partly because of Dazzling Angel, which just sits around. I mean, you have the Cat Collector. Like, if you play Cat Collector with Dazzling Angel in play, that's like this game-breaking play is pretty much how it feels. Same thing, a Johnny's Pride Mates in play, you gain life. Like, you know, these cards are just around and they have these really good baselines like the Cat Collector does, like a Johnny's Pride Mage does. And then you can just gain life with your three mana, two, three flyer who doesn't really ask you to do anything to gain life other than, you know, play other creatures. So Dazzling Angel has ended up being one of the best commons in the set with the 58.3% win rate. And I gave it that C plus in the set review, but it's more like a B minus. This stat line plays really well in the format for reasons I already mentioned. And the life gain being incidental itself isn't too shabby. And then there are lots and lots of ways to take advantage of gaining life in the format. Let's look now at Elf Sworn Giant. So this has a 52.3% win rate, not a good win rate. And it had, I gave it a C plus in the set review. So same grade as Dazzling Angel. Definitely not that good. You know, the one thing, I really like this in the set review, obviously from the C plus I gave it, mostly because the landfall trigger is pretty powerful. You know, generating one ones for every land that enters is pretty good. But this stat line ends up being pretty bad on many board states. You know, a 5-3, you know, it gets above being killed by Bolt Lightning and Stab at least but it does die to a braid. It dies to a bunch of two and three mana removal spells that can kill it really easily. And that is a pretty big tempo hit. You know, it's not quite as backbreaking if you're playing like a four mana two, two in this format, but it is very easy to kill. And, you know, when I've played with it, and I've played with it a fair bit because going into the format, I thought it was gonna be pretty good. The ideal thing is to try and wait until you draw a land so you get that one, one, right? And once you can do that, it feels okay. But I have found myself, and based on the win rate that we're seeing here too, it must be happening to other people, I have found myself having to run this thing out on five without a land often enough, and then, you know, staring down like a creature that it can trade with that costs two or three mana or something like that, and my opponent can just attack me just as well as they could a minute ago. So it just doesn't add a significant enough body to the board often enough, and you don't get enough elves out of it for it to really move the needle either. 
I mean, I'm not willing to say it's like a full-on F, even though the win rate is similar to something like Goblin Negotiation. Fact is, it's still a creature, <laughs> you know? It adds to the board, and there are certainly games it can take over. That's not something you can say so much about Goblin Negotiation. Those situations are even rarer. But it's definitely not good, and it's a 5-drop that you're going to be cutting a lot of the time in this format. So it's more like a D-plus, you know? Gave it a C-plus coming in, but I think it's a D-plus now. All right, let's look now at Feybloom Trick. So I like this in the set review. Gave it a B minus. That means you can first pick it sometimes. That means I think it's a very impactful card when you play it. That means that when you see it pick four or five, it should pull you into the color. So yeah, I mean, I thought the card was good, but it's even better than I expected. Um, of any card we're looking at here, of all these underrated cards, <laughs> it has the highest win rate. It has a win rate of 59.4%. So, you know, that is performing incredibly well. You know, it's one of the best uncommons in the set. In fact, right now, I think it's sort of in competition for that best uncommon slot in the set spot. It's moving around a little bit between a few other cards, but it's in there. Um, and yeah, I mean, the reason I liked it are the reasons that it's good. It's just even better than I expected. Um, paying three to get two one one flyers at instant speed is already pretty good. And you can often cast this, tap down your opponent's only reach creature or flyer, and then if you're in blue-white, which is, you know, where this can really excel, even though it's good everywhere, um, you can tap down their only thing that could block your creatures and then attack with everything, pretty much. Um, it gives you a huge swing in the game, as evidenced by its, you know, game-in-hand win rate. And it's very difficult for your opponent to ever come out ahead against a card like this, short of them countering it when it's on the stack. There's, like, never a situation where you can do something about what this card does that feels okay, you know what I mean? And that's always a good sign for how good a card is going to be. And yeah, I mean, I think Fabloom Trick is more like a B plus. You know, it's in that territory of very easily first pickable uncommon. You take it more than most of the rares and mythics in the set, and you'll play as many of them as you can get, and you certainly will. Let's look now at Flame Wake Phoenix. So here uh, is a card that has a 51.8% win rate. It's tied with Telerian Terror, for the lowest win rate of all the cards we're looking at. So this one's a reprint too. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are two of them on the list. This is the other one. And it performed pretty well last time we saw it. And I think it was even in the, the Konzo Tarkir Remastered and played pretty well, but Limited is a lot different now. Um, so why did I think this was gonna be like a B plus level card? Well, because I like the idea that it's a three mana two two flying haste. You know, I did of course mention the double red does make it a little bit worse because you usually want to cast your haste creatures on schedule, right? That's part of what makes them so good. And getting double red and limited on turn three is far from guaranteed. But I like that it would be relatively easy to bring back. This is one of these synergy points. You know, here the, the synergy is power four or greater. That's like there in your red green decks, but it's mostly a sub theme. Like doing the stuff with a uh, Garrick's Uprising and stuff isn't where you want to be, generally speaking. So it's usually more of a sub-theme. And that hurts Flame Wake Phoenix's stock. But the other thing I think that hurts it too is that like in the 10 years, more than 10 years now, geez, since Cons of Tarkir, there's like way more reach <laughs> in this game. And there are way more flyers. Like this thing can't block Dazzling Angel, one of the most played good commons in the set. It can't be, you know, it, it has to attack so it has to attack directly into that thing, and that's a card you see all the time. Uh, it dies to two Fabloom Trick tokens, right? We've, we've already looked at some cards that this is it's horrible against, basically. Um, and there's also the 1-4 Reach Spider, which, you know, is a solid card. I've seen people, you know, especially right after the pre-release, talking about it being, like, a busted common. I haven't seen it that way, and the data doesn't say it's that good, but it is solid, and lots of green decks run it, and it does do the job, and it is a card that you aren't unlikely to see when you play your Flame Wake Phoenix. So there's just all of these common and uncommon flyers and reach creatures who just make a 3-mana 2-2 haste a lot less good, especially when you're not playing it on schedule. And the fact you can get it back doesn't really, doesn't really move the needle that much, because it's still a 2-2 that has to be attacking and stuff. So they're just, in short, there aren't that many board states where this is just getting in perfectly easily. If there were, it would be a lot better, but they just don't line up often enough in a format that has lots of better statted flyers and reach creatures. 
All right, next let's look at the one non-common, non-uncommon uh, on the list for us here, and that is Quilled Great Worm. So this one, I gave an A2. I had it in my top 10's bomb list, I think at seven or eight. Um, and it has not performed that well. Uh, it has a win rate of 54.4%, which is not a bad card. That's like right, right at playable, like solid playable territory. Uh, but it certainly looks better than that. Like this is, this is an evaluation where I understand why I got sort of excited about this one. This one doesn't surprise me. I overrated it as much as the others. Cause look at this thing. It's a six mana, seven, seven trampler. And the combat damage trigger is a big deal, right? The, the fact that your creatures just get bigger and bigger. And I even envisioned you having a relatively easy time getting Quilled Great Worm back from the graveyard because you just have to hit your opponent a couple of times with things and there you go. And you don't even have to hit the opponent. That's what really pushed it over the edge for me in, in my head when I was thinking about how this card would perform. All your creature has to do is damage an opposing creature. Well... The problem with the Great Worm that keeps it from being this bomb that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to bet everyone else who did a set review gave it a bomb grade too, uh, is the fact that there are lots of board states where you play the Great Worm and they're just, you already have to have decent attacks, right? And that's something I kind of overlooked in my excitement. Your creature has to survive uh, combat with another creature for the counters to matter. Unless you have first strike, there's a combo for you. You don't end up on a board where you look at it when you play a Great Worm and you're like, great, I can attack with all three of these and everything will be fine. You just don't end up in that spot often enough. Sometimes your creatures aren't big enough to attack to begin with, and a lot of the time, the best they can do is trade by the time a Great Worm comes down. Now, so the Great Worm still, like, is a six mana, seven, seven trampler that can grow to a 14-14 trampler on the next turn when it hits your opponent, right? So it still has this like ceiling, but you know, it's kind of funny that it's sort of just, it's like a glorified Colossal Dreadmaw in a lot of ways. I mean, it's better than that, right? Because it does get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it does have this upside where if you're already ahead, yeah, I mean, it seals the deal because your opponent can't block your stuff without uh, giving your things counters. Um, but it doesn't line up that well that often and getting enough counters to bring the Great Worm back from the graveyard really doesn't line up very often. So it's like nice top curve to have if you're in a green deck and not a bomb at all. I think it's more like a C plus. And you know, if it if it manages to stay around this win rate, it may just be a C, which is, which is wild. But when you really think about the card and if you've played with or against it, you've probably been surprised too. You're like, eh, it's not that good. I don't have a good attack. My opponent doesn't have a good attack. And then if they do have those things, like they probably would have turned the game around anyway with the Colossal Dreadmaw, right? Uh, not turn the game around, but seal the deal with the Colossal Dreadmaw. So yeah, it's a it's a card you play and you're never going to cut from any green deck, but it is not one you should be taking highly, despite how exciting it looks. All right, next let's look at Arbiter of Woe. So... This is actually the second card I underrated. There are two that I underrated. I misspoke earlier because I underrated this one too. I thought this one was going to be good. Uh, I gave it a B minus. You know, this kind of creature usually fares reasonably well where, sure, you've got to give something up when you cast it, but you're in black, right? So you're going to have things to give up. And then this trigger is really going to punish your opponent. So I gave it a B minus. I actually got a significant amount of pushback about how good I thought this was going to be in this format in the comments uh, of the set review. But it turns out it's even better than I thought it was going to be. It has a win rate of 59.3%, just below where we saw Fabloom Trick. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, I, was, I talked in an earlier video, uh, in last week's video, I guess, where I was giving you some, some broad takeaways about how every color, pretty much except for red, has like a six drop you can play in your deck that can get you back ahead from behind. I failed to actually specifically name Arbiter of Woe, even though it was in that list in my head. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's what it does because it comes down, causes life shift and gives you card advantage. And then you still have a huge flyer around that really makes a difference. And part of what makes it so good is there is just a lot of good fodder just in black. I mean, Infestation Sage is where it's really at, but you've also got the two mana one one discard rat and Infernal Vessel at Uncommon. Like, it's just not hard to have something that's worth giving up. And even giving up a full card for this feels pretty good because of the amount you get back. So the one interesting thing about Black is that the 
sacrifice theme, like there's not a sacrifice deck in black red, but the best black decks in this format can really leverage this Arbiter and Vampire Gourmand, who are two uh, really good sacrifice outlets. It can leverage those into some serious value uh, by, you know, again, sacrificing the cards I mentioned, like Infestation Sage, the Rats, and Infernal Vessel. Um, those have all been really, really good cards together, uh, and they're all, they all have good baselines too, so that's part of what makes them so good, but yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is a card you want, it's a card you can first pick, it's really not that hard to build around it, it just happens naturally in most black decks in the format. Next up, it's Inspiring Paladin, which I gave a C plus to, uh, but it has a win rate of 53.7%, which isn't disastrous, especially compared to, to some of these, but it's not great. You know, looking at this card, I thought it being a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three that has first strike when it attacks was like a pretty decent card to begin with. And then you add in the plus one plus one counter stuff and things get even better. Overall, uh, it ends up not feeling that great. Part of it is that the whole plus one plus one counter theme um, isn't really there in, in green white. Like you can make it work, but like I've been saying about most of these archetypes apart from black white, it's more of like a sub theme. And part of the problem for uh, green white is that it's signpost uncommon is one of those three mana two twos that it's huge liability to play in a format with um, Burst Lightning and Stab. So, you know, other colors have these super powerful signposts and commons, like the three mana two two that loots when it enters and attacks, or the even the three mana two three flyer that goes plus one plus one to all your flyers. Like those cards all do something up front when you play them and they don't die to cheap removal before they do something. Like they give you some sort of value that's significant. And it's hard to do that with the green-white signpost, and that really hurts a card like Inspiring Paladin. This format only has one gold uncommon for each color pair, and if the one you have is kind of a liability, it's going to pull down all the cards that synergize with plus and plus one counters. Probably didn't help Quill Great Worm either, though I think that has more to do with its own design just on its own than it does with other stuff going on in the set. And I mean, the Paladin isn't a bad card. You'll play one of these in a lot of your white decks, but it is, you know, there are so many good white commons in this set. Like, it's a long list from the two-mana one-one cat that draws you a card to the four-mana two-three that puts a couple of counters places, Healer's Hawk, the one-mana combat trick, Dazzling Angel, which we mentioned. Like, there is a long list of commons that are significantly better than the Paladin because they're better in their own right. They don't need synergy to really generate good value and they're either like really cheap or they generate value immediately when they enter and that's just not what the paladin's about it mostly just ends up being like a solid little three drop in your deck not a white three drop that you're super excited to play so you know i gave it a c plus in the set review i think it's more like a c minus a card that you end up cutting a significant chunk of the time and then the last card i want to look at and it's kind of a stand-in for a bunch of the morbid stuff uh is needle tooth pack which i gave a b2 in the set review i noted throughout my set review and you know even when i was talking about the mechanics before the set came out i noted that the whole uh morbid thing is always harder to get going than it looks like it always is the problem being like you know you're always like well creatures die all the time in magic surely this will trigger and it's like that's true but you have to have creatures die in the same turn that this thing is in play, um, which isn't a, a massive ask, but it is one. Like, you have to have those things line up. You have to have the five mana to cast it, or it already has to be in play for this to trigger. And so the morbid stuff collectively, and like as a color pair in black-green, largely just doesn't work. There are some exceptions. Um, the five mana, five, three that comes down and can kill something, uh, you know, minus 13, minus 13 versus minus one, minus one. That card's been pretty good, but I think part of that is just having an actual effect, <laughs> an additional effect, no matter what, because the minus one, minus one can matter. Whereas needle tooth pack really needs you to trigger morbid or you're playing a sub rate creature. And like there are games where you can run away with morbid and you can run away with these triggers, but they're usually games where you're already ahead, where you can just attack your opponent they're forced into blocks or trades, and they just have to give you these triggers. Whereas if you're not already ahead, your attacks are meaningless to them, and Morbid only triggers on your turn. So they just have to make sure to sort of play around it a little bit, but that's not a huge price to pay overall. So, you know, these Morbid triggers, as expected, are harder to get going. And even this one, which I liked partly because I figured, you know, you only have to trigger it once and it's gonna be pretty good, and that's true. 
And then I had this upside in my head that, you know, you'd trigger it multiple times and it would turn into an insane value engine. But overall, it's hard to make that happen. You know, you could sacrifice your own stuff. That's kind of the best way to get it going. But that's still not that effective. It takes a lot of setup for a payoff that's good, but not great. So it's it's definitely not a B. It's probably a C minus. That's probably where needle tooth pack ends up and it might just end up in the D range in the end. All right, so that is the list of 10 cards I was wrong about in Foundations. Next week, we'll be taking a deeper dive into the data and I'll start looking at cards that are being overvalued or undervalued based on how they're actually performing and where they're being picked. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you wanna catch future videos, including Foundations draft videos, more videos talking about this format and what the data means, or a bunch of other magic content too. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.